I'm going to talk about the power of kingdom faith. Say that with me. The power of kingdom faith. I am convinced that you should not trust anyone who have not been tested. Don't trust anyone who have not been tested. Somehow we've developed the idea that testing is a sin. Going through a test is some kind of an indication that you are out of God's will. And this is a very dangerous misconception. Somehow we believe that when things are not the way we think they should be, then we begin to wonder if something is wrong with us or wrong with other people, or maybe we are not doing something that is right, or maybe even thinking that we are sinning. Somehow we relate tests and challenges with sin. And I want to correct that tonight. That is not true. You would remember, if you read the Bible and the four Gospels, there was an incident where Jesus met a man who was blind. And the story actually says he was blind from birth. And the religious leaders had already concluded what caused him to be blind. So when Jesus came into the village and the blind man cried out for help, he went to the blind man and he began to address the situation. And one of the religious leaders said to him before he acted, he said, Master, was this man born blind because of the sins of his parents? Interesting. And that question is still asked today in your mind and in the life of our community. You need to talk a little quiet, sir. You need to talk a little quieter. So it's important for you to have an answer to that question. Your house burned down, your first question, or maybe the comments of other people around you. Shift immediately to questions of integrity. What are you doing wrong? Why? If you wasn't doing something wrong, your house wouldn't have burned down. So they assume that the burning house is payback for sin. Your baby died in the womb. Miscarriage. <coughs> Question. What are you not doing right? Maybe your husband is sinning. Maybe you ain't paying enough tithes. Maybe the Lord left you. And they, they build this massive case against the experience of something that seemed to be negative. This is a very common human experience. So here's Jesus facing an issue where a man has a physical problem, he cannot see, and the religious people have already concluded why he's blind. They say he's blind because his father and mother must have sinned, as if God gets you if you sin. And Jesus answered wonderfully. He said, this man is not blind because of anybody's sin. He said, but this blindness is for the glory of God. Now there's a shock. Maybe it may be helpful then to 
discuss the word glory a little bit. Because if, if, a, if a handicap or a problem or a challenge or a test of blindness is connected to glory, then give me more blindness. And there's your paradox. Okay, write the word glory down just so that we can deal with the comment of Jesus. The word glory is the word doxa, D O X A. It's a Greek word, doxa. This blindness is for the glory of God, the doxa of God. The word doxa, here's what it means, write it down. It means nature. Nature. N A T U R A. Or it means true weight. W E I G H T. It also means heavy. This blindness is to show the glory, the doxer of God. How can this problem reveal the nature of God? Well, Nature has to do with what something is like. What is God like? Well, the only way to know what God's like is for him to reveal his nature. You can only know how strong someone is when they try to lift something. So you can brag of how strong you are as much as you want. The test, everybody said test. Yes. The test is what you can lift. So the test reveals your true nature. Are you really strong? So testing is not demonic activity. Testing is built into the system of faith. Jesus said, God made sure this man could not see until this moment. Because I have to show you what God's power is like. So I need blindness. So I could show you that God could make blind men see. So I... And it's not even the seeing that's important, nor the blindness. What's important is to show you that God can do this work. Are you with me? Yeah. So God's strength, his power is revealed in tests. So I want to talk about this power of kingdom faith. The kingdom of God is not a lazy, shallow, timid, frightened community of people. We're tough. If I wrote the Bible from my own inspiration, I would have canceled 80% of the stories in the Bible. Because 80% of the stories in the Bible are full of trouble. And yet, the Bible is packed full of acts of faith under pressure. Matter of fact, no one made the Bible without going through tests. When I say made the Bible, you, you didn't make the list. <laughs> Just think about some names. And you think about trouble, don't you? Abraham, trouble, can't have baby. Moses, trouble, can't talk. And God never healed his tongue. He was a murderer. Trouble. <laughs> Jacob stole his brother's birthright. He was a thief. Anyone you call, their whole life is full of trouble. I wouldn't put that in the Bible if I was Jacob. I would put good things. Not that I was a thief. But that's what makes them so great. They were able to go through and come out the other side 
better than when they went through. The God we serve doesn't protect you from problems. He proves you through problems. You know, the last few years in the church community around the world, I'm talking about maybe the last 30, 40 years or more, uh, there have been incubating a theology that places a negative spirit on testing. Almost to the point where it is suggested that if you are not doing well, you must not, not be doing right. <laughs> and if that be the truth, then we got to cancel Moses, we got to cancel Jacob, got to cancel uh, Obadiah and Jonah and Micah and Nahum and Habakkuk and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and especially Abednego. I mean, them fellows wasn't doing nothing wrong and God let them go in the fire. No. Let me ask you to write some statements down. I want to talk about the value of your faith. The value of faith. Number one, write this down, please. The most important power you possess is your faith. Please remember this. I want to strongly reinforce this reality. What is the most important power you possess? Faith. I can't hear you. Faith. Shout it loud. Faith. A little louder. Faith. No, your faith. Say it, my faith. My, my faith. faith. That's the most powerful thing you possess. When you lose that, you lost. Not only is faith the most important, powerful thing you have, but it is the only thing that threatens the devil. As long as you have that, he cannot succeed. Your faith is your only protection. Number two, write this down. Faith is your belief and your conviction that creates your confidence in life. That's number two. Faith is your what? Belief and conviction that creates your confidence in life. You can only have confidence if you possess faith. When you lose faith, you cannot be confident. You become wavering. You become questioning. You become weak, and all the forces of earth run over you, destroy your life. As a matter of fact, when you lose your belief and your conviction, there's no reason to live after that. Number three, your faith is manifested by the tests it encounters. How is faith manifested? By the Say it loud. By the A little loud, everybody. By the Louder still. By the so how do I know if you have faith? There has to be a test. The only way faith can be manifested is through a test. This is why God would many times take his time answering your prayer. It ain't the answer he's interested in, nor the prayer. He's interested in what you're going to do while you're waiting. <laughs> Are you still going to have confidence in the waiting period? Help us, Lord. 
So I'm no longer impressed by your bragging of how great God is to you. I want to see how great he is when the bottom falls out. That's the test. Number four, your faith is as strong as the test it survives. I'm going to keep repeating that for the rest of the year. Say it with me. My faith is as strong as the test it survives. Say it again. My faith is as strong as the test it survives. God will only know the level of your faith by the test he allows you to face that you survive. I want to give you number five, but it's not written down. Number five. Faith is God's pre... No, sorry. Testing of your faith is God's prerequisite for trusting you. I'm going to say it again. Testing of your faith is heaven's prerequisite for trusting you. The word prerequisite, some of you may be a big word. <laughs> it simply means before. A requirement necessary before something. God will never trust what he didn't test. And if you call test negative, you will never be trusted by God. How you handle pressure, test, attacks, challenges is God's laboratory of experiment for him to trust you. Oh, you can think of a thousand examples, right? Just like that. I think the best example of all is Jesus Christ himself. 30 years old. At 12, he knew his mission. He told his mother, I must be by my father's business. At his birth, the angels announced that he was the son of God. The wise men came and confirmed it. And yet God didn't trust him. And now he's ready at age 30 because it takes 30 year old to become a rabbi or one who is a teacher in his culture. So at 30 he's now ready to begin his mission and God says not yet. Let me test you first. So God took him, dipped him in the water, bring him back out. <laughs> he confirmed, thou art my beloved son, but I still don't trust you yet. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tested. And the word tested there is the word tempted. Wow. At the end of the test, 40 days, 40 nights, the Bible says when he had passed the test, that there's a verse after that. It says, and Jesus left the desert filled with the Holy Spirit without measure, end quote. In other words, you know, God would give you the Holy Ghost on the front side of the test. But when you finish the test, he baptizes you in a special power. Why? Because you're going to need it for the next do you know that as soon as he came out of the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit, the first thing he met was not a celebration party of how he won. The first person he met out of the desert 
was a demon-possessed man. Next test. Sometimes you say, God, we just went through a tough time. Give us a break. God says, listen, the life of kingdom citizens is proving their faith. If he had to test himself, who do you think you are? I think the most dangerous prayer you could ever pray, and some of you have prayed it in great ignorance, is this prayer. Lord, use me. Listen, don't pray that prayer. It's too late. I know you've already done it. That's why you're going through a little hell right now because he's answering your prayer. If you want him to use you like the use his son, he's going to take you, he's going to lead you to the wilderness. You have to be qualified to be heard. Write it down. You have to be qualified to be trusted. God used no one he didn't test. And so your faith is really as strong as the test it survives. You're tougher than what you're going through. Okay? So take heart. Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. Because great is your reward at the other end of the test. You know, here's something else I thought was interesting. What is the object of your faith? Your, see, the object of your faith determines the strength of your faith. Write this down. The source of your faith determines the quality of your faith. Where you got your faith from is the question. If your faith falls up under a little stress, under a little problem, a little surprise, a little sudden thing that happens, then I want to know where you got your faith from. What is the source of your faith? Where did it come from? Do you know why we become disappointed in people? No matter who they are, it could be a, a spouse, it could be a parent, could be a child, could be a pastor, could be a politician, could be anybody, a good friend. The reason why we become disappointed in them because we had faith in them. And so our faith was as good as they were at the time. And when they changed, then our faith in them changed. So where did you get your faith from? Is it coming from the people and the situations you are in? That's an important question. Because wherever you get it from is the source and the quality of your faith. Number two, write this down, objective of faith. The object of your faith determines the quantity or the size of your faith. Now, we got two things here. We've got quality and quantity. How much faith do you have? In other words, how big is your faith? That depends on the object of your faith. What you have your faith in. You know, I keep promising to do this and for years, but I think I'm coming to the point where I, I'm going to eventually do it, maybe 209. I'm going to put together a marriage ceremony built on kingdom ideas. Because most of the marriages that we use, the ceremonies we use, are questionable. Let me give, tell you why I'm saying this. When you get married to someone, that marriage is 100% faith. It ain't love, it's faith. And that's why they don't stay together. Because we put our faith in the person, and that's how strong your faith is. Remember, the source of your faith is the quality, and the object of your faith is the quantity. How much faith should I have in this woman? How much faith should I have in this man? Answer, none. Why? Because if they are the source and the object of your faith, then they control your belief system. 
And so you hear things like, I can't believe you anymore. What they mean is, I lost faith in you. Well, if you had put your faith in God, and God is the one who you depend on to keep this relationship, then if anything happens, your faith doesn't move. Because it was never in the person. Let's get too deep for you, I know. I'll leave it alone. I feel I'm just hitting a wall. Okay. But let me just comment on this number two. The object of your, object of your faith determines the size of it. In other words, your faith is as big as the God you have it in. Now here's the problem with the God you have it in. You don't know enough about the God you have it in to claim that you know the God you have it in. And that's why the Bible says you must study. You have to get to know God for yourself because the more you learn about God, the bigger your faith becomes. Number three, object of your faith. Your faith is as secure as what your faith is in. Hmm? If you got a faith in this chair you're sitting in right now, then that's how, that's how secure you feel. Some of you came and sat down and didn't even check the chair. You just walked in, boom, sat right down. Why? Somehow, there's been some assumption that these have been used before, or maybe you even used them before, and you have this confidence that makes you just sit and you just believe that you'll be secure. How many times have you ever fallen out of a chair or the chair break? Let me see your hands. Anyone had a broken chair before? Yeah, man. A couple of times I saw on the chair and the chair break. Brum. I became very, very sensitive after that. <laughs> and I took the chair and moved it out far away from everybody. Why? Because my trust in that chair failed. Your faith is as secure as what you have it in. What's your faith? Is your faith in a church or in God? Is your faith in a relationship or in God? Is your faith in a priest or a pastor or is it in God? Then your faith will only be as secure as what you have it in. Number four. Object of your faith. The stability of faith is determined by the stability of its object. The reason why you don't put an anchor in sand is because when the currents come and the winds blow, There is instability. So you cannot trust the anchor. Do you know a miracle is a temporary act of God? So don't trust miracles. I think that's one of our problems in the spiritual relationship we have in the kingdom of God. We somehow measure God by what he does. Yes. And so when he doesn't do something, our measure changes. It's sandy. How stable is your faith? It's as stable as the object it is in. Don't even trust the works of God. Number five. 
is a question. What is your faith in? Ask your neighbor the question right now. Ask him. What is your faith in? Again, what is your faith in? Look at him right now. Ask him. What is your faith in? That's an important question. And sometimes we think we have already answered it. Is your faith in Pastor Miles? You better check it. Is your faith in this ministry? You better check it. Your faith in television ministers? Better check it. Where is your faith? What is it in? Is your faith in the blessing God gave you last year? Where is your faith? Well, here's an answer I thought was interesting. Uh, it's answered by Jesus. Mark chapter 11. Jesus said these words. Have faith in God. Verse 22. Isn't that beautiful? He said, look. <laughs> he caught fish for them. He healed Peter's mother-in-law from fever. He paid their taxes. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He walked on the water. He stopped the winds for them. He said, don't faith in none of those things, my dear. Have faith in God. Ask your neighbor, what is your faith in? Let him answer you. Where's your faith? Come on, answer them. My faith is in God. Say it. Let the devil hear you say it. My faith is in God. Let the angels hear it. My faith is in God. Now let God hear you say it. My faith is in God. That's the only thing that is stable. Hallelujah. That's it. We're running a race, you know. And sometimes we forget that. We think we're just here to get Christmas presents from God every day. This ain't no party. This is citizenship in a country in a planet that is very adversarial toward the kingdom. Don't forget, we are in a fight. We are in a race. We are not in a great big celebration where everything is good. The devil has not left the earth. I just thought I'd remind you of that. And demons ain't gone from the planet yet. You will overcome the world. After a fight. And so you're in this race. What's the fight? I thought I would read this again. I thought it was important. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 11 says, But you, man of God. Everybody say man of God. Man of God. Woman of God. That includes all of us. So you, if you claim to be a man of God, a woman of God, that means a citizen of the kingdom of God. If you claim to be that you belong to God, then he says, flee from all of this Conditions, circumstances, and pursue righteousness. What is righteousness? Right, right positioning. Yes, right standing with God. Good. Trying to stay, stay, got to stay in relationship right with God. Why? Because the next statement says, because godliness and faith are necessary, love and endurance are all necessary, gentleness, all necessary. Why? Because you got to fight. What's the fight? Fight the good fight of faith. It's verse 12. What's our fight? What's our fight? What is our fight? You're not even fighting the devil. Well, this is an important point. You think you're fighting the devil. He says the fight in the kingdom is for your belief. The devil is really not your ultimate enemy. Your ultimate enemy is doubt. His job is to get you to doubt. 
what God told you. So the fight is to come up after you've been under the water of life for a long time. And when you hit, when you hit the surface, you go, I still believe. And they'll put you down again. Hold it down. I still believe. <laughs> Can you live that way? I lost everything. I lost everyone. I lost everything. And I still believe. Then you won. You don't lose when you lose the blessings. You lose when you lose your faith. Because your faith will always get back the blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. So the devil says, I have to get rid of this faith. If I can destroy her faith, his faith, I have won. So Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Next verse says what? Take hold of eternal life. It doesn't just come to you. I know you got eternal life. He said, but you got to fight to keep it. The devil wants you to even believe that you ain't saved. If I am saved, why is this happening to me? If we save, why is this happening to us? If, if I'm saved, why am I losing this? And God is saying, this ain't got nothing to do with that. Do you believe even if it happens? What a faith God given us, eh? Powerful faith. Hallelujah. Please don't miss Sunday morning. Boy, some good stuff coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, listen, this. I like what Paul. Paul gave us a couple of hints here. Let me, let me write them down. I took them out for you. Number one, fake confession will be tested. Yep. Say that with me. Fake. Let me tell you something that's very important. This is a key in the kingdom. A kingdom key. Now, keys are principles, okay, that kingdoms will operate by. Jesus said... I will give you the keys. Here's one of them. Never say in the kingdom of God what you don't mean. Well, this sounds simple. You know, uh, one of the laws that God gave Moses to give to the nation that he was building was a strange law. Matter of fact, uh, the Ten Commandments are used by our governments, but they miss out a few of them. But they use most of them to, to run countries, you know? Like, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. A lot of countries use these laws to build their countries. But they miss out a few. Here's one they don't use. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. What does that mean? Jesus explained it when he came to earth 4,000 years after Moses. Jesus said, and he was, giving, he was going through the laws, you know, do not commit adultery and do not covet and all this stuff. And when he got to this one, he says, he says, look, do not take the Lord's God name in vain. He repeated it. Then he explained it. He says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. He says, Anything more than this is evil. In other words, don't ever use maybe in the kingdom. Oh boy. Let me explain how deep this is. It has to do with faith. If you say yes, I will do this, or I believe this, that must be tested. Are you getting this? So keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Death and life is really, truly in the power of your tongue. There is a key in the kingdom. The key says whatever you proclaim must be tested. The word is must be. So you don't talk if you don't want no trouble. 
It is a law in the kingdom. And yet, here's the problem. You can get nothing in the kingdom without saying it. I feel like just shouting all by myself. You shall have whatsoever you say it. The part he don't add is after the test. Hallelujah. So you tell your friends, I believe God for this thing. Now it's out there. Oh my God, it's out there. You already put it out there. And the next day, everything opposite happens. Now what are they going to say but you now? If you think it's, you know, this, this faith thing ain't working for you. It's you, this God ain't working for you. See, you have to understand the system. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, God normally talks to you privately, but you have to profess it publicly. You know, this, is a, this is the deep part of the kingdom. God talked to Moses by himself, you know, in the back of the bush, in the mountain. Uh, Mo, such and such and such. God talked to Abraham, always by yourself, privately. You know, Abraham, blah, 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 you can have a baby. Okay, Abraham now got to go back to that village where all those people know him and say it. Now he's thinking, no problem. I can say it because, you know, God said it. He can do it in nine months. <laughs> the Bible says, and Abraham believed God. Okay, believing God doesn't guarantee immediate answer. It does guarantee a test. Hallelujah. Let me tell you why you are in trouble right now, okay? This is it. Your mouth got you in trouble. You said something, and the principle of the kingdom is it must be tested. Let's prove it. Here's a verse, Luke 22, verse 31. This guy was a member of BFM. His name is Simon Peter. <laughs> okay. Simon said to Jesus, Master, watch him now, I will die for you. I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I am with you. I will support you. I mean, Peter was just, boom, speaking out. I will never abandon you, Jesus. And Christ responds. Look at the words he used. Simon, Simon. In other words, the way God, Jesus said it was, oh, boy. Oh, man. <laughs> You know, that's the way it works, brother. You should have never said that. Hey, by the way, have you wondered why none of the other disciples joined him? And none ever tried to say it afterwards? Because <laughs> they heard what Jesus said. Jesus said, Simon, Simon. Watch this now. Satan has asked, the word he has demanded, to sift you, test you, as wheat. Now, this is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the one who made the devil, created him. He said, look, Peter, you just qualified yourself for a test. By the way, I'm sure most of you know what a sift is. Or do you? You sure you know what a sift is? No, man. Only folks in Bandown know what a sift is. Bend down sift is not the kind of physical sift you guys. You all use like screen wire, call that sift. Sift in Bain Town, the original one, was a flat piece of tin. And you take a nail, you just knock little holes right next to each other in every fraction of that piece of metal until there's a, nothing but holes in this piece of metal. That's a sift. Now read that. He says, Satan has demanded to lay you out and test every area of this statement that you claim you ain't never going to deny Jesus. You ain't never going to forsake him. You ain't never going to abandon him. I'm going to test it right 
through the hole. Anybody feel that way lately? Yeah, boy, you feel like, oh, man, we by ourselves. Man, God forgot me, man. This is, uh, can I make it through this? God said, hang on. Your mouth got you here. Let your mouth keep you here. <laughs> say, I believe. I believe. No, no, that's what you got to say when you're in it. <laughs> I still believe. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do not consider it strange. I'm quoting Peter chapter 1, that you enter into fiery trials. How did Peter know that? Peter spoke himself into it. He said, look, I've been there. I like this verse, though. Look at the next statement. And Jesus said, but I have prayed, not just for you. I prayed for your faith. When you're going through, still believe. Amen. Believe what God spoke at the beginning. This ministry... It's stronger than anyone's criticism. Amen. Stronger than anybody's opinion. Stronger than anybody's presumption or assumption. This ministry is a result of a word God gave. And, and listen, you can tell if something is genuine. It always comes back out of the fire, staggering, and say, I still hear. I still here. Smoking and everything, all kind of hole in them. I still here. You know, I think one of the greatest acts of example of faith I saw was in the movie, The Terminator. Come on, tell somebody I'm a Terminator. Yeah, you can't terminate the Terminator. I mean, they blew his head off. Boom, fella still walking around half a head. I'm still here. <laughs> I mean, they, they burned him up, put him in the fire, he came back up. That's faith. Faith says it doesn't matter. What happens? I still believe. What destroys you? May God help us. Jesus said, Peter, I pray for your faith. I didn't pray for you to get healed. Notice it. He didn't pray for his healing. He didn't pray for the devil to leave him. Didn't pray for demons to not bother him. He didn't cast the devil out or nothing. He said, I, I, I pray for what your belief through the process. That's why it's the most powerful thing you possess. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if, if you can just keep that, the devil lost. Did Peter make it? Look at the last part. He says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Let me tell you what that means. You are not qualified to help nobody until you needed help one time and you made it through. It is the test that allows God to trust you to help other people. I told you all on Sunday, Bahamas Faith Ministries is about to move to a level that I don't know what it is, but it's so awesome. God's checking everybody. And if you are standing firm and strong, he says, I'm about to trust you with something I need tested people to trust. In your personal life, the bigger the test, the bigger the assignment that's coming up next. So don't be impressed by people who are always having a good time. Learn from those who went through the fiery furnace and the lion's den, who had boils all over their body. They scrape it with tin to get the pus out, like Job. You get, you get, get, learn from people who, who got a story. Trust people who got scars. I remember we were teaching our little kids to, to walk. I'm sure you all had this experience too. You have little children, they're babies. You know, when babies are ready to walk, they start trying to walk. And then the parent will come and say, come. And the baby take one step, and take another step, and then the baby fall down. And guess what the parents do? They don't take them and say, oh, you can't try no more because you fell. 
the parents put them right back up to fall again and say, come. And why do the kids come? Because they trust the parent. The fall was not as important as the parent's call. You missed it. God is still saying, come. And you fall down. Ain't nothing waking. God said, get up, get up, come. And he ain't coming to help you, no. He tell you, come. <laughs> Sometimes you got to pull yourself up. Because if he believes I can still walk across there, then I am going to walk toward him. Amen. Hallelujah. That's called faith. Trust. That's what kids have in parents. He says, when you've been tested, then you can help your brothers. Bahamas Faith Ministries is a leadership organization. The only way to test leadership is through trials. And if we are going to teach and train leaders from around the world, we're going to have to have a story on every corner. Been through that, yeah, been through that. Oh, we did that, yeah, we've been through that. Yeah, we've been broke many times, man. You can be all right. Listen. You will never be blessed financially by God until you've been bankrupt a few times. <laughs> and you got to have faith in the middle of the bankruptcy. Job was totally bankrupt. Everything gone. And Job says, even though he slayed me, even though he slayed me, my trust is not in the wealth and the house and the sheep and the goats. It's in God, he said. Where is your faith? Hallelujah. Are you blessed? Yeah. Tell your neighbor you're going to make it through. Okay. I want to close on this point and then Sunday morning is going to be awesome. Because your faith's going to explode. Hallelujah. Write this down, please. The impact of God's works. Now, this is very important stuff here to understand in the kingdom lifestyle. Number one, the goal of God's works is to place your faith in him and not the works. I'm going to say it again because it's a little bit confusing. The goal of God's works, it's miracles and blessings, all that stuff, is to place your faith in him, not the works. In other words, God would do something in your life so you could trust him. What we do is we trust what he did. Oh, Jesus, have mercy. I'm afraid to say what I'm thinking. Can I say it? Because the book of Proverbs 5 says, the thoughts of a righteous man are always right. So, so let me check. We normally say, if he did it for you, he'll do it for me. That ain't necessarily true in the kingdom. That's true in religion. God never did anything for Joshua the way he did it for Moses. Nothing. So what he did for me, don't put your faith in what he did for me. Put your faith in God. He mightn't do for you what he did for me, but you still got to trust him. Yes. Lord, help me. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God works so you could put your faith in him. The impact of God's works. Number two, very important, John chapter 2. Watch this. Verse 11. This is the first of his miracles and signs that Jesus performed at Cana. Remember he turned the water into wine. Remember that? It says, he therefore revealed his glory. 
And then his disciples put their faith in him. Well, what was the glory? The wine. But they didn't put their faith in the wine. Because Jesus never again turned water into wine. You know, God might not pay your rent right now. That got nothing to do with your faith in God. He may let your rent run right to the last day. <laughs> he may even let it run over the time to see what your mouth going to say. Lord have mercy. See, <laughs> the disciples saw the miracle but didn't put their faith in the miracle. Because miracles are temporary, remember? And they may never be repeated. So the Lord healed your wife when she was sick. So if my wife's sick, I figure, well, okay, the Lord can heal my wife too. And God says, wait a minute. That was his miracle. You don't know everything about your wife. Her assignment is finished. She gave you the kids you're supposed to have. Her purpose is completed. But God, she's so young. Shut up. My ways are past finding out. You know, I, I, what, what comforts me one time is when I was reading the four, I was a teenager reading the four gospels over and over again, and I realized that Joseph died with God in the house. The last time we hear about Joseph was when Jesus was 12 years old. And 12 years old is when a Jewish boy became a man. That's why he went to the temple to be tested. That was a test to become a man. His bar mitzvah in the Jewish culture. And so Christ became a man at age 12. That's why he told his mom and dad, don't you know I'm supposed to be my father's business? I'm, I can start now. You told me I'm a man now. I can start. Joe never showed up again. Mary lived all the way to, the, to, to his resurrection. But Joseph died somewhere in the time. My, my question was, God, was Jesus Christ in the house, near a sick bed, watching Joseph die? Yes. He raised Lazarus. Yeah, but he couldn't touch his own earthly father because his job was finished. So who are you to say someone died young? Your faith must be in God, not his works. Hallelujah. So as you go through this week and next month and next year and 2010 and 2014 and 2020, remember this message that no test is allowed that doesn't come just to build your faith. Didn't come to destroy. It came to test your faith, your belief in God. Not in people, in God. Not in circumstances, in God. Not in blessings, in God. What a wonderful thing to have faith in God. Faith and persecution. Here's one I thought was interesting. Acts chapter 6, verse 5. It says, the proposal pleased the whole group. I wanted to read this one because I thought this was an interesting guy. His name was Stephen. The book of Acts chapter 6 is about Stephen. When they appointed Stephen, you remember Stephen? He's one of the early disciples who were chosen as a leader in the local church. It says, they chose Stephen... A man full of what? Faith. Full of what? Faith. faith. You got to be full of faith to be chosen in the body of Christ. You can't have weak back people who run when pressure comes. Well, I quit. What do you mean you quit? You was the pastor. <laughs> they said they chose him in leadership not because he was educated, but his belief in God was so strong. Guess what? That belief 
made him a member of the Hall of Fame. Let's read the rest of it. It says, and he was full of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, they presented these men to the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. You lay hands on people who got two things, Holy Ghost and a lot of faith. Not talent, faith. Because when the going get rough, the talented leave. Mm. <laughs> it's your faith in God no matter what. You know, it's a little note here on Peter. Stephen's faith did not prevent his stoning. He was the first disciple to be stoned and killed in the road for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Man full of faith. But if you have faith, why that happened to you? Well, ask Stephen. If you're following God, how can God allow them to stone you? That's God's prerogative. Now, what, why? It is for his glory. How come you ain't in the Bible? Because you ain't being stoned. Let me tell you what's so great about Stephen. You know the story. It says that when they threw the stones on Stephen, big rocks hitting him, his head, his body beating him, and they stoned him to death. It says that before he died, he says, Father, forgive them. And then it says, his face became bright, for he had seen the glory of the Son of God. He died with glory in his face, with a smile. Can you die with a smile, with rocks hitting you, conch shells? You. This man's faith was stronger than rocks. And it was from his death that the church multiplied. It says, and the church scattered and grew at the death of Stephen. God used Stephen's death to give everyone else a purpose for living. If he could die for that faith, I could live for it, they say. Maybe God take you some stuff to make some other people believe that they can do it too. Yes. But it ain't easy when you're going through it, right? So, oh God, yeah, take somebody else. Use somebody else as an example. Don't use me. God said, no, I chose you because I believe you are full of faith. We were in a meeting last night. Wonderful thought came in that meeting the leaders last night I thought was this God will only allow you to go through something if he believes you can handle it yeah the Lord will not allow you to be tempted Beyond that which you are able to overcome. Not everybody could handle what you're going through. Because they're not qualified yet. So, go through. Because Papa thinks a lot of you. He believes you can handle this. So stand steady. Stand firm. Don't be discouraged. Walk Run, stand, and stagger out of the fire. And shout with all your might, I still believe. Amen. 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 Write these statements down as a review very quickly. We're going to talk first of all about the value of faith. How important is your faith? And what is faith? Well, the first statement I want to remind you of is this one. And that is the most important power that you possess is your faith. Your education cannot help you under stress. Your PhD is useless if the bottom falls out of your life. And so all the training that you have had cannot help you when your life falls apart. The only thing that can save a human in the midst of turmoil and chaos is their faith. And that leads to my second point, and that is faith is your belief and conviction that creates your confidence in life. 
You cannot be more confident than the faith you possess. Faith is the source of confidence. What is confidence? Confidence is an attitude of positive approach. To be positive in the midst of negative environment demands faith. Only a person of faith can smile in the face of danger. Only a person of faith can be calm in the middle of a storm. Only a person of faith can have a good attitude when there's a bad environment around. Faith is the only thing that produces confidence. That leads to number three. Your faith is manifested by the tests it encounters. This is very important. Now, I didn't say that your faith uh, is received by the tests you encountered. It is manifested by the tests you encountered. In other words, if you claim to have faith, we will see it by the tests you have to face. Because faith is proven in the midst of challenges. So bragging about faith doesn't impress anyone until your faith proves its presence by the tests it handles. This is why God allows testing. God allows testing to manifest your dormant faith, which you brag about. Can I put it another way? Uh, the only way for you to know how much faith you have is by the tests you encounter. You will never know how strong you are until you test your muscles. Faith is the same way. You will never know how much faith you have and how strong it is until you face a test. And that leads me to number three. Your faith is as strong as the test it survives. This has been our theme for the last four sessions because we as individuals and as a organization will have times of testing but it's not the test that's important what's important is how you are when it's over what is your condition and it's your faith that keeps you in the midst of a test only faith can survive tests but the amount of faith you have is measured by the test it survives Here's something to encourage you. The Bible says, God will not allow you to be tested beyond that which you are able to overcome. Now, that's a, that, that's a wonderful statement because what it means is that if God allows you to be tested, right away you know that you possess the faith to overcome it because he won't allow you to be tested beyond which you are able, which means that God controls the measure of tests. Now, this may be difficult sometimes to understand. Uh, let me just basically, uh, let, me, let me quickly put a little caution here. Uh, don't confuse the test that God allows with the test you create. You know, uh, the Bible says God does not tempt any man but each man is tempted, James chapter 1, when he is drawn away by his own lust. In other words, if you put yourself in a position where you create your own problems and then you call it a test of God, that's a lie. The Bible says God does not tempt a man. That means set you up. God allows things to happen naturally in life or even unexpected things, things you can't control, but he allows them to come against you because he knows you can overcome them, he says. So you can always tell what God thinks of you by what he allows you to face. Isn't that beautiful? So the, if you're going through a big test right now, that's a message from God. What God is saying is, you can handle this. Hang in there. Stand firm. He's telling you your faith can handle this. So the bigger the test the more faith God believes you possess. And that's the joy of knowing that faith works. Matter of fact, let me take it one step further. 
how faith is strengthened. How do you strengthen your faith? Now, of course, you know how to receive faith, right? The Bible says that God has given every human a measure of faith. That means the capacity to believe something. All of us can believe things. We, we believe the doctor when he gave us medication. We believe that it's going to work. So that's faith. We believe when the bank says, come pick up the check. We believe the check is there. That's faith. We believe that when we work all week, didn't get any money, we can get paid on Friday. We work all week, we're getting paid because we believe they're going to pay us on Friday. That's faith. In other words, every human being has the capacity to believe. However, the Bible says the kind of faith that you need to have is the faith that comes by hearing the word of God. Now, you hear the word of the doctor, the word of your boss, the word of the teacher, but God says make sure your faith is built on the word that I tell you because the words of the teacher and the doctor will fail many times, but you got to have a word that doesn't fail. So we know how to receive faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Tonight, what you're hearing is the word of God. So I am not wondering whether you're going to receive faith tonight. You already feel it already, right? Yes, sir. You feel your belief expanding. As I talk, you feel your belief growing. Why? That's faith coming, increasing by the word of God. But how do you strengthen your faith? Well, let's read this statement and write this down. Faith is strengthened by conviction in the power of God, not his works. This is very important. And I know that Pastor Richard, Dr. Pinder dealt with this on Sunday. I want to repeat this. Faith is strengthened by what? Conviction in what? In the power of what? God, not his works. In other words, you should never put your faith in the works of God. Put it in the fact that God has power to do anything. Even if God doesn't do some things you expected, you still got to have your faith in God and his power. Let me put it another way. God got the power to do and the power not to do. And sometimes we don't even think about that. God got the power not to help you. <laughs> and he got the power to help you. And you got to believe in the power. Because the power is more important than the works. And sometimes when the power is not at work, the power is still present. I remember Jesus went to his own hometown one time, and the Bible says he could do no great miracles there because of the unbelief of the people. In other words, the power was present, but the power shut down because the atmosphere wasn't right. And does it mean that Christ allowed people to stay sick? Well, he couldn't heal them. And by the way, Jesus went to a cemetery one time and raised one person. The place is full of dead people, and he is the resurrection, but he can decide how many people he raises. So he has power to act and power not to act. And sometimes we get mad at God because he didn't act, and God says, wait a minute, I'm God. I got the power to not act as well. You got to trust me when I don't act. This is why faith should be in God and not in his works. I like this statement here. Uh, Abraham, uh, you know, was a man of faith. The Bible says he's the father of faith. Uh, Abraham was promised a baby by God at age 75. The baby didn't come until he was 100. How long can you wait for God to fulfill a promise? Well, I don't believe, you know, this is from God because it's been 10 years now. Well... Does God have the power to bring it to pass? Well, this thing ain't working because I've been waiting for 15 years. Well, do you still believe God can bring it to pass? Well, it's been 20, 20 years now, Pastor Miles been promising this and promising that. Ain't nothing happened. Uh, can you wait 25 for one baby? No wonder why Abraham was called the father of faith. He believed in a baby for 25 years that he never saw. Your faith is what keeps you confident in the midst of the test. It says, and yet Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Regarding what? The promise of God. But was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. How? By being fully persuaded that God had power to do it. See, his persuasion strengthened his faith because his faith was in God's power. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what our weaknesses is in life? We try to 
put our faith in the power we possess. Maybe that's why God sometimes reduces us to zero. Suppose Abraham had good sperms and his wife had a good womb. Then he could depend on his sperm and the womb. But the Bible says God dried up Abraham and he made Sarah barren. So now the guy had to only believe the promise. He couldn't believe the body. He couldn't believe his ability. He couldn't believe anything about their biology. He had to so totally trust God. Has God ever told you something that you ain't got nothing to do with it? Absolutely. And God will reduce you to dependency. Write it down. God will reduce you to zero because he wants your faith not to be in what you could come up with but with what he said. And Abraham's key to straining his faith was, I know I'm barren, my wife is barren, I'm dried up, but God said. And if God said it, God has the power to override a dried up sperm and a barren womb. How many things can God do? Anything, including nothing. And so we have to trust God no matter what. Uh, here's one that I think is very important, and that is, what in the world can stop your faith? I wanted to, to, to bring this back up, and I know Dr. Pinder dealt with this on Sunday because it's so important to understand. You see, some people believe in God until something bad happens. And then they start questioning God, backing off from God, moving away from God. And here's the Apostle Paul throws out a question. He says in Romans 8, what then shall we say in response to this? If God be for us, who can be against us? But who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us? Will he not also along with him generously give us all things to enjoy? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Say that with me. Who will bring charge against me? Listen, when you trust God, people will attack you. They will begin to accuse you, criticize you. Paul says, look, but who can do such a thing? They didn't die for us. Christ died for us. We don't belong to them. We belong to Christ. He paid for us with his blood. That means you ain't got no right to talk about another man's property. You didn't pay for me, so you can't say nothing to me. That's what he's saying. Christ died for me. You didn't die for me. So your opinion should be kept to yourself because I don't even, you don't have the right to criticize me, he says. Who can bring a charge against me? You didn't call me. You didn't raise me up. You didn't help me through these past 20, 30 years. You didn't bring me through fiery trials. How dare you criticize my moment of test? That's what he's talking about. And then he goes on. He says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? But it is God who justifies. By the way, the word justified, write it down. I want you to get the meaning of that word. It means rights. R-I-G-H-T-S. It is God who gives his own people their rights. What is rightfully theirs. God says, look, don't worry about what, they, what they're saying about you. I'm going to give you what I rightfully promised you. You stay faithful. You know, you imagine the Bible did say that, a, that, that Sarah, first of all, Sarah laughed at Abraham first. Do you remember that? His own wife laughed first. People will laugh at your faith. And the thing is, the woman who's supposed to bring the baby was the first one to laugh at the guy. Abraham went home and told his wife, sweetheart, God told me in the mountains we're going to have a baby. She said, listen, yeah, you 75 years old and no Viagra around. You know, you, you must be crazy. And the Bible says she laughed and the, then the scripture says, and the Lord heard her. And the Lord came to her in the night and said, Sarah, you shall surely have a, 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 a son. And the Bible says, Sarah stopped laughing. And guess who started laughing? It says all the women in the village started laughing at her. See, there'll all be somebody laughing when you're going through your test. Now imagine people laughing and gossiping and murmuring for 25 years. Some of you only have folks laugh at you for a couple months or maybe a couple days. Imagine 25 years of scorn 
murmuring. Every time she passed to go to the well, the lady is sip, 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 sip. But you see, your faith can't be in the sip, sip. It better be in the word and the power of God. That's what kept Abraham and Sarah sane. Your sanity is tied to your faith. Write it down. If I go behind people, I will lose my sanity. The only sane people on earth are people who walk in faith. It says, who is he who condemns? Can anyone condemn you if you walk by faith? Now they will attack you. The Bible says that they will bring charges against you. But he says, how dare they condemn you? Let me tell you something. No one called you except God. No one can keep you except God. Some people think that their opinion is important enough to share with you. And they believe that their op opinion of you is worthy of you listening to. And they also believe that their perspective of your life is so important that you should submit to it. And what God is saying is, who can condemn you? Don't even bother to listen to them. You know, I'm very cautious with my ears and even my eyes. Certain papers I don't read. And then certain parts of newspapers I don't read. Why? I don't want to contaminate my mentality. And this is very important. Some people read newspapers from back to cover, including the ads. And they don't know what they're doing. They're feeding their faith. Faith comes by what? Hearing and reading. In other words, you keep hearing information, reading information, it becomes your belief system. That's why you can hear negatives all week about, you know, downturns, unemployment, cutbacks, high gas prices. All of a sudden, you're walking around with this depression. You're wondering why you're depressed. Because you fed your faith. Your belief system has become negative system. And you begin to accept what you hear more than what you heard God say and believe. Who can condemn you? He says, it is Christ who died. More than that, it is Christ who was raised from the dead to give you life. How dare them? They, they try to criticize you and attack you. They didn't call you. You know, sometimes I believe we believe that people call us so they could recall us. You still believe it? Well, what does that have to do with you? That's none of your business. Well, if it's me, I'd have forget God a long time ago. You sound like Job's wife. And some people believe that their opinion of God is more important than your belief in God. We got to be careful. Who condemns you? No one. It is Christ who died for me. I love what he says in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall trouble? There's the first question. What kind of trouble are you going through? You will go through many troubles. Our country shall go through many troubles. Our family shall go through many troubles. Your life will go through many troubles. Even your ministry shall go through many troubles. But the question is, what can separate you from the love of God? A little bit of trouble? And then he adds, shall hardship? Now let's be honest. Some of you are going through hardship right now. And you're questioning whether God works, whether faith works, whether the kingdom works. You're questioning all the stuff you heard. Let me tell you something. Your test is to challenge what you said you believed. That's why the test is there. The test is there to, to see whether all the things you've been saying amen to for the last six months, whether you, your amen is true. <laughs> he says, a little bit of trouble, a little hardship, a little persecution. You know, when you go through tests, you get a little persecution. But he says, oh, that can't separate you from the love of God, your faith in God, your love for God. Persecution is a part of the, the test. It's part of the process. Hardship. Hardship means you down to your last dollar and the rent is due. God says, no problem. Still have faith in me. And then they say, well, you got to move out of the apartment. God says, still got faith in me. And that's tough, eh? Because man, now they're telling you, you know, they can put a, change the lock on the door. And you're like, where is the faith Dr. Monroe talked about? God says, hey, just a little bit of hardship. Is this going to make you turn your back on God? Read the Bible. Could you imagine Paul praying 
to God, the one you serve, and God let him go to jail? I imagine Paul, you know, all the steps toward the jail, Paul kept thinking, well, he, he can come get me now. You know, when they first come arrest him, they tie him up. Paul says, he can loose me when they get down there. He get down there, God don't loose him. Then he goes before the court. God, Paul says, angel come into the court, can knock down everybody, and they can get me out. Ain't no angel showed up, Paul in the court. Now the judge tried Paul and find him guilty. Paul says, oh my goodness, God can get me just before I go into the, to, to, to the jailhouse. Paul goes to the jailhouse, no angel. Now they open the door, Paul says, I know what they can do. While they're sleeping, God can open this door. I'm coming out of here, and God can work a miracle. No door open. And then Paul spent the whole night. Paul said, God come and get me in the morning. The next day, no God comes. Hardship. Well, I know God can bring this, this rent payment as soon as the bank say I got to come out. God says, let me, let me just check, see if we can go beyond the payment. God let Paul stay in jail. And then, Paul says, then, then Paul says, you know something? Watch Paul now. Paul says, you know something? Since I'm in jail... Let me sing. See, God will lead you even sometimes right in the midst of hardship just to check your attitude. Do you still believe in God when the key is thrown away? When they lock you out, do you still sing with the luggage in the back of the car saying, Lord, I still love you. I praise you. You're still my king. I'm still a citizen of the kingdom of God because I like this person. And watch God turn that thing around and someone walk around and give you a house. And you ain't reckoning no more. But he's more concerned about your response than he is about what's happening to you. And Paul's response was right. Paul began to sing. Paul began to worship in the prison. You feel like you're in a prison tonight? Nothing's working out. Everything's locked down. God says, sing. Let me see your faith. And Paul began to sing. And Paul says, Silas, you're a young boy. You ain't been through tough times, son. Come, join me in singing. You can't go to any house. You might as well sing. And he began to sing. And the Bible says, suddenly... See, God could have stopped him in the courtroom when they arrested him in the trial, but God would allow you hardship right to the end to see if your faith is more important than your circumstance. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And God will bring sudden deliverance after he has satisfied himself that you got faith in him, not what he does or what he doesn't do. And you notice the rest of the story. The Bible says that night... The whole prison fell apart. The walls crumbled. All the prisoners were set free. And notice what happened, eh? Paul went in jail to set the other prisoners free. Sometimes God would allow you to go into hardship to bring other people out of hardship. Your challenge is to prepare other people to know how to handle it. You know... In recent weeks, we've had some challenges that face this body. And I shared with the leadership, I said, you know something? God somehow knew we could handle this. Now the others will know how to handle it. And I heard a report just tonight from people who are not members of this church, professional people, and they said, we are impressed by the way you all handle it. See, we go to jail so other people can be set free. You make it through your tribulations, you're going to bring a whole lot of people with you. God doesn't test you to destroy you. He tests you to purify your faith. Paul says, can famine? What is famine? Write the word famine down. The word famine is the old word for economic crisis. High food prices. High gas prices. In those days, the economy was built on what? Agriculture. So famine means economic collapse. Paul says, will economic problems turn you from God? If you lose your job and then ain't nowhere to find a job for a while, do you say God doesn't work? It doesn't work? Can famine stop your faith? Let me tell you something. God is never unemployed. He is always working on your behalf. So when you are unemployed, he is still employed, working on your behalf. And when your deliverance comes, you will not be made ashamed in Jesus' name. God is going to work in the midst of farming. Then he said nakedness. Nakedness means, you know, it doesn't mean you walk around your clothes off. It means that you can't buy clothes, man. 
thing so tight, you got to keep wearing the same thing. God says, that's all right. Let me see your faith in the same old clothes. Do you have faith to believe me when you can't change clothes? Look at that. That's what a powerful verse. Paul was trying to tell us that our love for God shouldn't be dependent on our work, the works of God. Our faith needs to be in God because God never changes. You change clothing, but you never change God. And God can bring you all the clothes you need, but he will test your faith so your faith will not be put in clothing, but in the one who provides clothing. Give God a praise. He said, your clothes is not your source of faith. And then he says, danger or sword? That means are you willing to face death and still believe in God? Some of you may have to in the future choose between death and God. And the Bible says, will your faith still be more important to you in God than you are in preserving your own life? What a level of faith. There are two kinds of faith. And I wanted to mention this again. Dr. Pender talked about this. So please get that tape on Sunday. But I want to emphasize this again because when I saw this, it exploded in my mind. Two kinds of faith. One, you have faith for promises or for things. That's, that's okay faith. And most weak Christians have that kind of faith. Most shallow kingdom citizens have that kind of faith. They love to serve God and believe God for what they could get. That's faith for promises. Now remember that Abraham had a problem with this because Abraham couldn't even handle the practical side, he, his body wasn't working. His wife's body wasn't working. So he couldn't have faith for things. So he had to put his faith in what? In the power of God. So you have faith for things, for promises. God promised you something, you got faith for that. I don't want to get off this point too quickly. See, God promised all of us some things, including me in this ministry. He promised me to raise up this ministry, to build a campus here, to raise up a leadership center, all this stuff that I keep telling you about for the last 29 years. And some people say, well, you know, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't happening. Well, thank God my faith ain't in your faith. Amen. You see, let me tell you something. If you got faith for promises, what happens if the promise doesn't come to pass? That's the question. Do you still have faith in God? Do you only believe God because of what he does? Or do you have faith in God? No matter what he does or does not do. Your promises from God should never be the condition of your faith. I'm going to take it to another level. We as a ministry, therefore, must not, and you as an individual must not, put our faith in what happens around us because what happens may not be what we want to happen. But our faith is not in what's happening. It's in God. So we got two kinds of faith. Faith for promises, and then we got faith in trials. Now, what do I mean by this? What I mean by this is faith in the midst of trials. Some people got faith as long as the promises are coming. Do you still have faith when everything falls apart? The greatest faith on earth is faith in God in the middle of a trial. That's the greatest faith. Anybody can have faith when they get a bonus. <laughs> Anybody can have faith if they just get an, a, a, a nice job. Anybody can have faith if they just buy a new car. They thank God for days. What do you do when your house burns down with everything in it? Can you fade in the midst of a burning house and say, God, that's okay. Houses come, houses go, but you remain. I have faith that this shall overcome. I shall overcome this as well. See, you need faith that is bigger than faith for promises. You need faith that can handle trials. Faith that can walk into a lion's den, walk through a furnace, Faith that can handle a giant that's ten times bigger than you. Faith that can be a song in the middle of a prison. What's your faith? I think God is sick and tired of these milky Christians looking for Christmas presents from heaven all the time. 
He's over. He's, he's tired of this. Everybody wants to just get blessed, bless me, bless me. God said, let me try you. Let me see you believe me if there's nothing else but me. Faith in trials. That's faith. Can your faith be tested when everything is, is not working? Because I still believe in God. I want to put it this way. You need to have faith when you can't see anything. And some of you are there right now. You, you've been trying for five months, two years. And you say, God, this, I still ain't seen. God said, okay, uh, you're almost at the end of my testing period. Sometimes we give up just before the breakthrough. Because we have our own timing on God. Now, you know, Abraham, can I keep going back to Abe, man? That's a long time to wait for baby, eh? Now, me and Ruda, you know, the God I mean, and that boy, listen, I know. <laughs> I don't know if I can handle that. Every time Abraham saw his wife, he had to say, I still believe. She's 90 years old. Abraham says, somehow, I still believe. I mean, how warm by this time is like a prune. You know, it wasn't bad at 75. It was bad, you know, but now it's 90. She's really gone now. And some of you ladies around here talking about, well, my clock, clock. The spring was lost in her. I want to talk about the clock. She was gone. Abraham still say, honey, he said it, I believe it. Somehow you're going to carry a baby. 95 years old. He could not see how that could be possible. Write this down. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6. Paul says, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body... We are away from the Lord, and therefore we live by faith and not by sight. He says, look, now let me explain the first part of that. He says, look, we, we got to be confident in God, even though we can't see everything. Now, let me explain why the first part is important. He says, if, if, if we were in heaven, in the spirit world, we could see the whole thing from beginning to end. He said, but we are on earth in the middle of the thing. We can't see the whole picture. So we got to trust God who see the whole picture. So we got to walk by what we believe, not by what we see. Did that come across right? Yeah. Are you sure? You know, it's like, it's like, you know, and them scientists, sometimes they make a maze this funny maze, and they put a little rat on the other end, and the rat got to find its way to the other end where the cheese is. Now, you as the scientist can see the whole thing. You actually can even see how you can get there. And you're wondering, why does rat go in this way? He could go that way. Why rat hitting this wall? He could just turn around. He said, now if he just take one more turn, and you can see the whole thing, but the rat can't. All the rat sees these walls. And he sees a little break. He sees another break, and he doesn't know what to do. And God said, well, I can see the whole picture. But you can't see the whole picture. So put your trust in the guy who can see the whole picture and ask him what to go, where to go next. <laughs> Faith is believing what you know more than what you see. Living by faith means we don't know how we're going to get out of this. But God knows how we're going to get out of this. So what you don't do is don't panic when you can't understand. Amen. Say that with me. Don't Say it again. Don't Please get that into your spirit. One of the keys to my peace is I don't know, but he knows. Amen. No use panicking. Don't panic. What panic does is tightens all your arteries and your veins. It causes your blood constriction, which raises your blood pressure which causes you not to have problems in your heart and can actually develop stroke. Just from panicking, worrying. And God says, let not your heart be troubled. But believe in God and believe also in me. Why? I see the whole picture. Sometimes we are that close to a breakthrough, but we can't see because the wall is in front. And he's saying, just two more turns and you're there. And you say, no, this ain't working. I've been in this maze for the last six years, and this ain't working. God says, no, you just got two more days to get there. 
That's why the race is never to the swift. But those who keep going, tell your neighbor, keep on going. You're almost to the cheese. I can write a book on uh, who find my cheese. <laughs> Not who move my cheese. You got to find your cheese. You got to make it there. There is a reward for those who diligently seek him. But he says we must live by what? Faith. Notice it says don't use faith sometimes. It says what? You got to live by it. When you don't live by faith, high blood pressure takes over right away. Because you know you can't figure out what's going on in your life right now. You can't figure out everything. So you got to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own calculations, but in all your ways, acknowledge God, only you know. And he will what? Direct your path through the maze, you see? But you got to be faithful and stay steady and trust God. Can I hear an amen? amen. So you got to keep running the race. Faith is a race. And how to know your faith. How do you know your faith? 2 Corinthians 13 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. How? Test yourselves. Wow. How do you know if you have faith? Paul says, test yourselves. See what you can handle. Wow. Test yourselves. Can you still believe when nothing seemed to be working? He says, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. What a powerful scripture. He says, the way you know that Christ is in you is by the test you survive. <sighs> now, let me just say this again. You know, when people hear teaching on testing, they think it's a negative. But let me give you, let me ask you a question. If you want to develop strong muscles and you go to the gym, what you got to do? I can't hear you. You got to lift weights. What is weights? Test. And guess what? The heavier the weight you lift, the bigger the muscles grow. If you go to lift weights in the, in the gym and you lift weights that are so light that they don't test your muscles, your muscles stay weak. You always develop strength by heavier tests. Paul says, go into life and pick up stuff that no one else is picking up and test, see if you can handle it. He says, and if you handle it, that's proof that Christ lives in you. This is the beauty of the, the kingdom life. Kingdom faith is faith that's not afraid of tests. Matter of fact, kingdom faith is the kind of faith that calls the test to come. It actually tests itself. Lord, have mercy. Kingdom faith is what James talked about when James says, when you are facing fiery trials, welcome them as friends, he says. Welcome test? Yes, as friends. Why? He said, but they have come to test your faith and to purify it as pure gold. In other words, don't even wait for trouble. Tell trouble, try this one. Come get me. I want to prove how much Christ I got. Say that to life. Can you tell life to come on? Bring it on? No, we pray for life to keep things away from us. Kingdom faith welcomes tests. People say, you're still standing? What are you talking about? That's nothing for us to handle. Why, man, our, our father, he knows we can handle this. That's why he allows things. You know, you are a strong that's the test you survive. So what you're going through now, don't panic. Don't give up. Don't lose your faith. Believe God. Why? When he is satisfied that your faith is in him, he brings you out in two, two minutes. Amen. Amen. Boy, I tell you, sometimes, you know, God will bring you a nice blessing after a long struggle. And as soon as you get the blessing, then he take it from you again. Am I right? Man, listen. Abraham, this guy, 25 years, waited for a baby. Baby came, right? 
Then God tell him, now bring the baby and kill him. Now, you know, Abraham said, look. <laughs> but Abraham believed God. See, Abraham was sharp. Abraham said, know something? First of all, he gave me a baby in the impossible. So he asked the baby, that's impossible. And he could raise the baby, that's possible. So it didn't matter to Abraham whether God took or take or give or take. It doesn't matter. His faith was in God and the power of God to do anything. How about your faith in Jesus' name tonight? Amen. Your faith is in whatever God says. And please stop, stop putting time on God. That frustrates your own life. But I've been praying for three years. God said, hey, 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 hey. One day is a thousand years. You got a few more hundred years to go before this thing happens. Don't, don't get upset about this. <laughs> God made a promise to send his son in Genesis chapter 3. Guess when he showed up? 4,000 years later. Can you wait 4,000 years for a baby to show up? Yeah. It was just four days to God. And here you are all upset because ain't nothing happened in the last three weeks. Nothing happened in the last three years. And, and you all uptight, you know, well, I'm getting old. I ain't getting married yet. No, God. God said, hey, slow down. You know something? That's why I ain't got no one in your life yet. Because you ain't got no faith. You got faith in people. He said, relax. Let me see if your faith is in me. Just in case you get married again and the fella leave you, your faith still intact. Because your faith is in me. But you got your faith in people and people leave you, your faith gone. He says, see if you can handle the test. And then that proves that Christ lives, Christ lives in you. Here's another one I thought was interesting. In the book of Job, boy, Job is something else, eh? I love Job. The endurability of kingdom faith. How long can your faith endure? I was reading Job uh, in reference to this, this whole session that the Lord spoke to me about faith. And, and he, said, he said, you need to read Job again a few times. And the last two weeks... I've been reading Job. Job blew my mind. Let's read what it says in Job chapter 1 verse 20. It says, And this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in what? Worship. What do you do when things fall apart? Now, if that was a Bahamian, he wouldn't worship. He'd cuss. I been going to church all these years. I sing in the choir. I'm in the worship team. I pay my tithes. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Why are you doing this to me? Job said, no, no, no. I'm going to worship. I lost everything. I'm going to worship. That's kingdom faith. Kingdom faith are not in the blessings of God, but it's in the God of the blessings. Because every blessing is temporary. Write it down. Don't put your faith in blessings. And Job understood it. Job figured that a house is temporary. Sheep, goat is temporary. Farm, temporary. Even wife and children are temporary. He said, I'm going to put my faith in God. Look at the next verse. It says, Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. He came to a conclusion that God could take everything. Are you there yet? When I made this statement, Two Sundays ago, some of you all were nervous about that. When I said God could take everything. You got to get to the point where you believe your faith can handle losing everything. You lost everything. How can you still trust God? Only if your faith was not in everything. Then you can trust God. If you only trusted God based on what you could get then you lose your trust in God when you lose what you got. Job says, my faith is not in anything I have because I didn't bring anything. And what I have, he gave me, and he could take it away. Matter of fact, look at it says. He says, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That last part doesn't work too well, eh? That last part doesn't work too well for us. The Lord give it, the Lord take it, let me praise the Lord. Wow. Where's your faith? Can your faith handle nothing? Can you trust God when nothing is working? 
That's kingdom faith. Kingdom faith is I believe in God, period. Verse 32 blew my mind. Verse 22, rather. It says, in all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. How many times have you blamed God for what's happening in your life? Do you know why I like this verse? Because this verse is also cautioning us against some of the charismatic movement teaching which says you shouldn't say anything negative. Yeah. Now, the difference between negative and acknowledging God's work, which may also be something that is not working. Job says, look, I am not going to condition my faith in God on what I have. That's not negative. And he says, if God took everything away, I'll still trust him. That ain't negative. He says, if I lose everything, I will still praise the name of the Lord. That ain't negative. Let me put it another way. Job was not conditioning his faith on what God gave. So whether God took it away, it didn't matter. Friends, tonight we are here to give God thanks no matter what. Can I hear an amen? Can I dare you for the next two seconds, lift your hands and thank God for whatever you're going through right now. Don't thank him for it now. Thank him in it right now. Just say, I praise you in the midst of this. Come on, those at home, you give him thanks right where you are. Your faith must not be in your environment or your circumstances. It must be in God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God. You know how many, do you know what is charging God? Even saying this, you know why that happened to you? Because you're the God's will. What you just did was you charged God with what happened to her. You don't charge God. If bad things happen, and again, bad is your definition, not God's, but if bad things happen to good people, then and you say that that person experienced that because they are out of God's will, then Abraham was out of God's will, Daniel, Joseph, Jacob, <laughs> uh, Moses. I mean, you got a whole list who are out of God's will. I won't talk about Jesus. Boy, that's bad to crucify a man who ain't done nothing. But it was God's perfect will. The Bible never says it is not God's will that any be tested. It is not God's will that any be not tested. It says not God's will that any should perish. Question, did Daniel perish? No, did Moses perish? Did Paul perish? They didn't perish. They had victory. They, they overcame the test. You will overcome your test in Jesus' name. I said you will overcome every test you're going through in the name of the king because your faith is in the king and not the test. Can I hear an amen? amen. Job said these words, and I love it. Verse 4 of chapter 2. <laughs> I like Job. Job says skin for skin. Now, Satan is dealing with God. Satan said, look, let's be fair. The only reason why Job following you is because of what he got. That sounds like y'all right now. Hey, don't sit down and look at nobody now. I'm talking to you. This is for you. Before we go home, think about this statement. Satan says, look, let's be fair. They only loving you because of the blessing. If you took away what you gave them, they'll curse you to your face, Satan says. Satan told God. Job got a big farm, got a nice family, wonderful marriage, got children, cows and goats and camels and all this wealth. He says, if you know the truth about Job, Job only love you for the blessing. As long as you have a good reputation, you love God. And then when your reputation changes in the community, you quit God. 
Oh, you only love God because of what you got. Do you know that, uh, I want to just make sure you understand this. Satan, I believe, makes many trips before God. He's probably making one right now on you. You're doing good right now. You got your job, got your house, everything doing fine. You don't know if skin for skin is happening up there right now. That's why I mean, I'm prepared to go with nothing. It's, sometimes it's good to be born with nothing, you know. Being down helps me learn to be humble all the time. I'm ready for Tom and Juju again. I ain't got no problems. Candle and ca kerosene, no problem. Why? Because if you believe that those things are the measure of your faith, what happens when they go away? Skin for skin. In other words, let's be fair, God. They only love you because of the blessing. Stretch your hand out and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to your face, God. Well, look at the Lord's answer. And the Lord said to Satan, okay, very well. I'll turn him over to you. He's in your hand. Anybody feel that way right now? <laughs> so they feel like, boy, the Lord must he let, forget me. No, he just turned you over because he trusts your faith. Oh, man, I feel like shouting tonight. God was saying, look, go for it. Try your best on Tony. Right. Tony is my man. I'm going to show you that Cheryl don't need nothing to serve me. Can God say that about you? Johnny? I know Johnny. Been faithful long. Oh, you want to test him? Go for it. I trust the faith of Johnny. Boy, God got faith in you. You're talking about faith in God, eh? God said, go ahead. He said, but you can't touch his life. I control the measure of your test. And I love what happens next. It says in verse 7, the devil left the presence of God and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Wow, that's a, that's a view, eh? Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes, scraping off all the scales of the boils, eh? His wife said to him, Honey, are you still believing and holding on to your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? I guess we've all been there. This ain't working. Just commit suicide. Quit. Forget church. Might as well go back into the world. Go have your fun. This ain't working. Curse God and just go and die. It came from his own wife. Now, you would think, at least you get help in the house. <laughs> Thank God we got this house that you can come to and tell you, don't curse God, because you ain't going to die. Because look what God said at first. He says, don't touch his life. God already told the devil, you only go so far with her. This is not about you devil, it's about her faith. Everybody say holding on. Hold on. Hold on to your integrity. You know what integrity is? Honesty. Integrity is being one with yourself. You believe what you said, and you said what you believe, and you act like what you said. It's integrity. I still believe God. It's integrity. She said, lie to yourself. Say it ain't real. Say it doesn't work. 
Tell everybody who you told that you follow God. Tell them you don't follow God no more. Lose your integrity. Give up. And I love what he, the answer. And Job replied, and sometimes you got to say this to people, you know, to protect your faith. Job says, you are talking like a foolish woman. Everybody repeat that. You are talking like a foolish woman. I want you from this day forward to give that answer to people who attack your faith. It's a biblical answer. Says, Sir, you are talking like a foolish man. Excuse me, let me leave your presence. And Job says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble also? And there's the statement I want to close on tonight. Sometimes we only love God when he does good things. What kind of faith you got, young man? I taught you all these years, man. Can you just stand firm through a little bit of trouble? Matter of fact, I'll say like Paul said, you all follow me like I follow Christ. Follow me. If you've if you, if you got a problem following Christ, follow me. Fall when I fall. Because you have to have faith to believe when nothing works. Do you know how many people died believing? They never saw it. Read the 12th chapter of Hebrews. They died and never saw what they believed for. But they died believing, Paul says. Can you die believing? What the next generation will see? That's how I'm going to die. I'm going to die believing what doesn't happen in my generation. He says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Say it loud. Shall I accept good from God and not trouble? Say it again. Shall I accept good from God and not trouble? In other words, kingdom faith doesn't fold under good or bad. Kingdom faith can handle good times and troubled times. Kingdom faith is stable. It doesn't matter what happens. Kingdom faith is what's happening. Can I handle good times and bad times? You know, the Lord spoke to me years ago. He said, you know, some people cannot survive success. Sometimes failure is good for you. It tests your faith. Because you can have such confidence in success, you believe you ain't never supposed to fail. And we think that failure is a permanent condition. Failure is a temporary classroom to develop your faith. So you can come out smarter than you when you, when you went in. Again, it says, in all this, Job did not sin in what he said. You know, that statement, you say that to some charismatic leaders, or people, they say, oh, that's negative. You're expecting trouble. Every day, Job said, wait a minute, I didn't expect this trouble. It happened. How many things come and they, they happen? You didn't expect them? But the Bible says, you got to face them too. And you got to also face them with unwavering faith. When I started this series two Sundays ago, the first statement I made to you was this. There are some things you can never explain. You can't explain how some things happen in your life. But you believe. And it's your faith that will overcome the world. Can I hear an amen? amen. It's your what? Faith that overcomes the world. Let's give God praise in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father.